Lecture 43, in which we bring the course to its conclusion. On the Temple of Apollo, at the foot of Mount Parnassus, near Delphi in Greece, there is a single inscription that sums up the Western tradition. Know thyself. The temple was the seat of an oracle, a priestess who spoke for the, for the god Apollo. She was the most powerful oracle in all of ancient Greece, and was revered as the ultimate source of wisdom. The oracle at Delphi once declared Socrates to be the wisest of men, because he knew what he didn't know. Socrates himself was condemned to death by drinking hemlock for corrupting the youth of Athens, by which his accusers really meant teaching the youth to think for themselves, to be skeptical of authority, and received wisdom. In his last meal with his friends, Socrates made no apology, declaring that the unexamined life is not worth living. These two aphorisms, know thyself, and the unexamined life is not worth living, exemplify the golden age of Greek philosophy and the beginnings of the Western tradition. In the 17th century, and following Socrates' example, the French philosopher René Descartes rejected everything he had been taught by authority in church and school, and resolved to achieve human knowledge by the application of human reason alone. He began by doubting everything, doubting everything except that truth could be known through reason. He doubted everything, including the fact of his own existence. But he resolved his stance of radical doubt when he concluded that from his conscious experience of thinking, he must exist. Hence, I think, therefore I am. By defining himself as a thing that thinks, Descartes initiated the modern tradition of philosophy out of which psychology evolved as a science. Scientific psychology has been a full participant in this tradition of Western thought, attempting to answer, through the scientific method, questions that have been posed by philosophers for more than 2,500 years. What is the nature of knowledge, and how do we come by it? How do feelings and desires arise? How does the mind work? How is the mind related to the body? How do we use our minds to solve new problems and create new things? How do we use our minds to negotiate our relations with other people? Writing toward the end of the 18th century, Immanuel Kant had argued that psychology could never be a science, because science was based on measurement, and the mind, being immaterial, could not be measured. Nevertheless, less than half a century later, Ernst Weber and Gustav Fechner asked their subjects to assign numbers to the intensity of their sensory experiences, and discovered the first psychophysical laws. Shortly thereafter, Hermann von Helmholtz and other physiological psychologists began their experiments on the perception of distance and depth, and Franciscus Donders showed how reaction times could measure the speed of mental processes. In 1879, Wilhelm Wundt established the first psychological laboratory at the University of, of Leipzig. And in 1890, only a century after Kant's pronouncement, William James produced the first comprehensive textbook summarizing the principles of the new science of mental life. Thereafter, the science of psychology grew rapidly. Wundt believed that scientific psychology was limited to the study of immediate experience, of sensation and perception, and that the higher mental processes, such as memory and thinking, were not susceptible to experimental investigation. Nevertheless, in the 1880s, Hermann Ebbinghaus measured the strength of a memory by how long it took him to memorize a list of nonsense syllables, doing for memory what the psychophysicists had done for the lower mental processes before. Francis Galton introduced standardized tests of individual differences in mental function, a paradigm quickly adapted along with Donder's reaction time method by Emil Kraepelin for the experimental study of mental illness. And at the end of the century, Ivan Pavlov and Edward Thorndike began their studies of learning in animals, 
and Norman Triplett conducted the first experimental study of social influence. These gains were consolidated in the early years of the 20th century. Clark Hull adapted Ebbinghaus's methods to the study of concept learning, conclusively demonstrating that higher mental processes could be studied quantitatively. Robert S. Woodworth and Robert Bernreuter introduced the questionnaire method for measuring personality and attitudes. And Walter B. Cannon explored the relations between emotional states and bodily processes. By 1931, when Mutzaver Sharif experimentally studied the effect of social conformity on the perception of motion, the circle was complete and psychology had emerged full-fledged as a quantitative experimental science of individual mental life in its social context. Psychology has made remarkable progress since those first psychophysical experiments, expanding its understanding of cognitive, emotional, and motivational processes, their relations with behavior, their biological substrates, and their ties to the social and cultural context in which each individual lives. Psychology, as Ebbinghaus said, has a long past, but only a short history. But in the short history of psychology as a science, we've learned a number of important things about how mental life works. And in some cases, visual perception, learning, memory, and categorization come to mind. We have a fairly complete understanding of how our minds work. And we've also learned a number of important things about ourselves. The first and most important theme in psychology is that mind matters. Human behavior is intelligent. It goes beyond reflexes, taxis, instincts, and conditioned responses. We do not simply respond automatically to environmental stimuli. Rather, we behave in accordance with our internal mental representations of these events. Our actions are based on our perceptions of the present, our memories of the past, and our expectations for the future. For this reason, cognitive functions having to do with the acquisition and use of knowledge have constituted the primary subject matter for psychology. Of course, cognition is not all that the mind does, and so psychology is also concerned with non-cognitive functions having to do with emotion, affect, feelings and moods, and motivation, goals and needs and desires. As Kant noted, there are three faculties of mind, knowledge, feeling, and desire, and psychology has to understand all of them. With respect to cognition, the most important thing we've discovered is that cognition is an active process. In learning, the organism is actively engaged in trying to predict and control events in its environment. Even with respect to a so-called lower mental process, like sensation, signal detection involves judgment and the person's expectations and motives play a role in something as simple as detecting a light or a sound against a background of noise. Perception is a constructive process in which the person makes inferences based on knowledge and expectations in the course of solving the problem of figuring out what's out there in the environment. And similarly, memory is a reconstructive process in which the person draws on knowledge and expectations and beliefs to try to figure out what happened in the past. Thinking involves not the mindless application of algorithmic rules, but rather the judicious use of heuristics as the person engages in judgment under uncertainty. And finally, we use language not just as a vehicle for communication, but also as a means of representing knowledge and as a tool for thinking. These cognitive processes themselves interact with each other. Perception leaves a trace in memory, and memory forms the cognitive basis for perception. Perceiving and remembering both involve a great deal of reasoning, judgment, inference, problem solving. Learning itself is a matter of problem solving, 
as the organism tries to predict and control the events that occur in the world around it. Immanuel Kant argued that knowledge, feeling, and desire were irreducible faculties of mind, and to some extent it's turned out that he's right. But it's also true that cognitive, emotional, and motivational processes interact with each other in important ways. First, to some extent, our emotional and motivational states are a product of cognitive construction. To some extent, our feelings are our beliefs about what we feel, and our desires are our beliefs about what we desire. But our emotional and motivational states, in turn, have an effect on cognition, shaping and shading what we perceive, what we remember, how we think and reason and make judgments and choices. And finally, emotion and motivation interact as we seek pleasure and avoid pain. This theme of interaction is brought into bold relief in our analysis of personality and social behavior. We know that aspects of the situation will shape the person and his or her behavior, but the person is also a part of the situation to which he or she responds. People create their own environments through processes of evocation, selection, behavioral manipulation, and cognitive transformation. The person, his or her environment, and his or her behavior constitute an ever-changing dynamic system characterized by reciprocal determinism in which each element is both cause and effect of the other two. This theme of interaction is continued in our study of development. Development occurs first and foremost as a product of the interaction between nature and nurture, between genes and environments. Genotypes are not decisive for phenotypes. Whether you're Piaget or the proponents of the theory theory, development occurs precisely because of the interaction of the child with his or her environment. Development isn't something that just happens to the child, with the child as a passive recipient of whatever forces happen to promote development, whether genetic or environmental. Rather, the child is an agent of his or her own development. And in fact, this role of agent is true across the entire lifespan from birth to death. Twin studies reveal the importance of genes for certain aspects of development, but the same twin studies that reveal the role of genes also reveal the role of the environment, and especially the non-shared environment, which appears to be the key to forming a unique individual person. And finally, we see the role of interaction in mental illness, in psychopathology. Mental illness emerges, in the first place, as a product of the interaction between two kinds of factors, diathesis factors and stress factors. We now understand that the diathesis can be either biological or psychosocial in nature, and so can the stress factor be biological or psychosocial in nature. Again, Genes are not decisive for phenotypes. Studies of the concordance for monozygotic and dizygotic twins for various kinds of mental illness reveal again the importance of the non-shared environment. In the treatment of mental illness, we see that drugs can be very useful, especially more modern kinds of drugs, but they're far from cures. The effects of drug treatment are magnified and complemented by psychotherapy, which actually tries to change the person, his mental states, his mental processes, and his behavior. And we've seen that the most effective kinds of psychotherapy are cognitive behavioral psychotherapies that focus on the here and now, that help the patient acquire new, more adaptive patterns of knowledge and beliefs, cognitive changes which promote behavioral change. The nature of these interactions are such that psychology has to be an extremely broad science, connecting many different levels of analysis. Psychology is partly a biological science because it's concerned with the relations between mind and body, including the endocrine and immune systems, as well as the nervous system. 
And psychology is also a social science because the behaviors it seeks to explain are social behaviors and the environment for the individual is the social environment. One particularly interesting set of interactions are those between nature and nurture, between our genetic and biochemical endowment and environmental forces, and between our evolutionary heritage and our cultural and heritage. The human mind, with its capacity for intelligence, language, and consciousness, is what the brain does, and the human brain is the most important legacy of biological evolution more important than walking upright, more important than having fingers rather than toes on our forelimbs. Our large cerebral cortex with dense neural inter interconnections provides an extremely powerful apparatus for general learning, for thinking, and problem solving. Likewise, the specialization of specific cortical structures for language and other functions provides an extremely powerful apparatus for symbolic representation flexible, creative communication. We create the environment through thought and action. Our capacity for intelligence, consciousness, and language sharply divides the dullest human from the smartest chimpanzee and gives us a uniquely human ability not just to adapt to our environments, but to adapt our environments to us. It's worth noting that the human brain which the evolutionary psychologists tell us was specifically geared to Homo sapiens living naked in the East African savanna in the late Pleistocene era, permitted us to move out of the environment of early adaptation, invent clothes, control fire, and populate the entire surface of the Earth, including permanent settlements in Antarctica and maybe someday the Moon and Mars, all without a scintilla of biological difference between our brains and those of Adam and Eve. The mind is what the brain does, that's for sure. But one of the first things we did with our human brains was to create a human culture that provides the context in which individual mental life takes place. Culture can be defined as a set of assumptions concerning ourselves and the universe, a set of categories for understanding experience, widely shared among a group of people, and transmitted from one generation to the next. Culture also records the history of the successes and failures of previous generations, on which new generations can reflect and from which they can learn. It includes a set of institutions, such as churches and schools, that preserve and transmit knowledge and values, and a set of rewards and punishments by which the group imposes itself on the individual. It also gives us a tradition of philosophy, literature, and art through which we can express ourselves and our thoughts and propose and entertain and debate possibilities for change in the future. Some other animal species have something like culture in rudimentary form, but none of them have anything like human culture based on the transmission of knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs through language. Distinctively human cultures are a product of a distinctively human mind and brain. There is something of a paradox here, which is that the distinctly human capacity for intelligence, consciousness, and language, which is itself a product of biological evolution, creates the possibility of culture, which in turn gives us the means to transcend the very biological forces which allowed it to come about. Unlike other animals, we do not have to rely on learning by trial and error. We can make use of social learning, including sponsored learning, deliberate teaching in institutions like universities. Unlike other animals, we do not have to rely on accidents of natural selection, but can literally make ourselves and the world around us. When it gets cold, we can build fires. If a river floods, we can dam it. If somebody breaks a leg, we can fix it. If we don't like where we are, we can change the place or move elsewhere. Such transcendence has its limits, of course. We're all going to die. But within broad limits, it's a fundamental fact of human nature that we deliberately shape the world to fit us. 
we do not have to rely on accidents of natural selection or even accidents of learning to shape us to fit the world. In a very real sense, then, the human mind is the basis of human freedom because it gives us three unique abilities. First, to transcend the past by learning from history. Second, to transform the present by solving the problems that confront us. And third, to create the future by transmitting our knowledge, beliefs, and values to the next generation. By using our minds, we can change ourselves and the world around us and promote our advancement into a higher, better form of life. But we can do this only if we take Socrates seriously and attempt to understand ourselves, not just our place in the universe, but also our place in society, how our minds work, and why we behave the way we do. That's the larger task of psychology, to understand the nature of human experience, thought, and action, and the role that the human mind plays in human life. Speaking for myself, and for all the folks at the University of California who have helped mount this course online, it's been a pleasure to introduce psychology to you this term. We hope we've stimulated your interest, or maintained your interest, and that we'll see you again in some upper division course some other time.